Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning's sales meeting is brought to you by Hoodie McHoodface. Uh, and with us today, we have the uh, Director of Strategic Operations for Rupert Neve Designs and SE Electronics, Jonathan Pines. But before that, uh, we're going to have the co-founders and owners of Analog Alien. So make them feel welcome right after this short video. <laughs> Analog alien artist Tony Rodriguez. Let's open up some gear. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having us here today. We are so excited to be here. My name is Joe Napoli, and filling in for Joe Walsh on guitar today is my brother Jack. <laughs> Together, Jack and I are analog alien guitar effects pedals. Um, that's it, folks. It's just the two of us. We're the company. <laughs> I've, been asked to, I've been asked to give you guys a brief explanation on how analog alien got started. But before I do so, I'd like to ask two questions. First, how many guys out there actually have an older brother? Any older brothers? OK, great. Now, let, let me ask you this. How many of you were ever actually crazy enough to go into business with them? OK, just me, Joe. Just me. I'm the crazy one. It was like, yeah, like, you remember? Remember last Thanksgiving? Oh, uh, boy. Well, what do you mean? That order was supposed to go to Ohio, not Idaho, Captain Dyslexia. <laughs> all right. This all started. <laughs> This all, I'm working on the stand-up. This, this guy, <laughs> this all got started when my brother started to play guitar at age 11, after hearing a song called Pinball Wizard. By the time Jack was 16, he'd become quite an accomplished guitar player. That summer, he came to me. I was only 12. And he said, Joe, it's time. I'm forming a band, and you're going to be my drummer. And he handed me a pair of drumsticks. And I was like, Hey, cool, I'm a drummer. Who knew? So I crashed around on a drum kit um, for the rest of that summer that Jack actually conned our dad somehow into buying a couple years earlier. I'm proud of that, too. And, the, <laughs> and be, basically, um, truth be told, uh, he probably threw me out of the band about 20 times that summer, citing my lack of practice for the reason of my dismissal. But for some reason, he just never really let me quit. So at the end of that summer, he called me into the living room, kind of excited, and he said, Joe, you got you to see this. So I came in, and what was on television was a documentary film about the Monterey Pop Festival. And Jack said, Joe, this is very important. The Who is going to be on in a few minutes, and you have to watch this. Now, I had never seen The Who, so I said, OK. And I sat down to watch. Well, I was immediately transfixed by the band. They slammed through summertime blues in my generation. And then in what can only be called synchronized chaos, they destroyed all their gear in an explosion of smoke bombs and feedback. I immediately got up and announced that I would be needing a second bass drum and ran downstairs to practice. Jack followed behind me two minutes later, and we've been making music together ever since. 
Jump cut 20 years later, after building two home recording studios, making countless recordings, and not going on tour with The Who, Jack came to me once again and said, Joe, it's time. This time his idea was to build a professional recording studio. So in 1995, we broke ground. And in 1998, that September, I pressed play and record for the first time and actually got paid for it. Now when I say we built it, I mean we really built it. Along with our dad, we poured the concrete footing and laid all the block for the foundation. We did all the carpentry, all the electrical, all the plumbing. And then we, did, and then we designed the two non-parallel wall floating rooms with complete omni and bi-directional diffusion, which was all, which was all handmade. Yeah, it's our dad. So at, the, at, at, but at that point, um, we, once we had finished, uh, we had realized we had spent 20 years of our lives in a basement. So we decided to incorporate skylights into the architecture of the control room, and we decided to call the studio Cloud9 Recording. And it's in that studio that the philosophy and concept of the analog alien guitar pedals actually came to be. So when I first opened Cloud9, when Jack and I were working on it together, the one thing in the beginning that really was most difficult, I, I struggled with, was when I got these guitar players who would come in with these pedal boards that were like, they looked like they belonged on the dashboard of the space shuttle. And no matter how many pedals they had or what guitars they were plugging into them, they always just seemed to sound the same. And that never made any sense to me. I mean, I couldn't understand why you dedicate so much of your life and time to learning to play the guitar, to be able to express yourself with the instrument, <coughs> only to plug into a personality vacuum and sound like everybody else. So after Jack heard me complain about this for about, oh, 10 years, he came to me and he said, Joe, it's time. And he decided that he was going to build his own guitar pedal. So he studied circuitry for months and months. And using the very large amp collection we have at Cloud9 as a reference, he developed our first pedal. Now, when I say Jack built it, he really built it. He hand etched the board himself. He drilled every single hole by hand, loaded all the parts, and then wired everything into this little box. When he got done, it looked like a pot of colored linguine. <laughs> he sealed it up and he brought it into the studio, and we used it every, on every session for about six months. And no matter who the guitarist was, what guitar they were playing, what style of music it was, this little magic box always seemed to get us the sound that we needed. So each session wound up ending the same way. The guitar player being blown away, swearing up and down that they've been looking for this pedal their whole life, and then turning to Jack and say, you got to build me one of these. So at that point, I don't have to tell you what happened. Jack came to me and said, Joe, it's time. <laughs> and he decided we were going to go into the business making guitar pedals. And uh, the result of that was the, is the Fuzz Bubble 45, which we sold our first one in September 2010. And that's how Analog Alien got started. Jack the Fuzz Bubble. <laughs> I think one of the most important things to remember about our pedals is, is that they're not personality vacuums. They don't suck the tone and life out of your guitar or your playing style. When we designed the Fuzz Bubble 45, we wanted to combine two effects that we thought would sound great together and work very well. The overdrive side is actually modeled after one of our favorite amps. It's a 1959 Fender Bandmaster. And the fuzz side was actually designed to work well with the overdrive side. And although it's a different circuit, it could be made to sound similar to the overdrive side by just taking the haze control down and the input, we can go to a nice, from a big fuzz to a power chord crunch. We like to incorporate more than one effect into a pedal. 
Uh, we think that you know it saves valuable real estate on a pedal board, and it also gives our end users more bang for the buck. The rumble seat is a prime example of that. It's three effects in one, and it's a nod to rockabilly. You have the rumble drive, which was inspired by a 1969 Marshall Plexi. You have a delay in the pedal that was modeled after a lot of the vintage delays that we have at our studio, Cloud9, and a reverb, which was inspired by the older Fender reverbs found in their amplifiers throughout the 60s, a classic reverb sound. Um, so the rumble drive, we have a real wide sweep with the tone control. You can hear it just shift. You basically just find the spot you like, which for me is right here, and you're in. The gain at this setting is um, just a little gain, it's just enough to give like your rockabilly chops some attitude. Turn the gain up, more attitude. And this is where rockabilly kind of ends and hard rock takes over when you increase the gain. The delay goes from 26 milliseconds to 620. At shorter delay times, you get that perfect slap back echo. You open up the delay and the repeats and you get those trails that um, you can hear in YouTube music made famous by The Edge and Pink Floyd. The reverb, one knob, very simple. At lower settings you're in your bedroom, maybe not alone. And you open up the reverb, and you're in a concert hall. And we added just a little modulation to the reverb to make it shimmer. We thought it was a nice touch. That's not found in the original Fender, but we liked it, and we thought we'd incorporate it. And it's designed to work together. It has to, because it's all in one enclosure. It plays nice with all the pedals, and when you put it all together... <laughs> As it turned out, the rumble seat proved that analog alien guitar pedals aren't just for guitars anymore. This was proven absolutely by Stevie Wonder, who used his rumble seat through his clavinet keyboard <coughs> during his performance of the song, We Can Work It Out, during the television special, The Night That Changed America, a 50th anniversary tribute to the Beatles, marking the Beatles' first legendary performance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Needless to say, this was a wonderful night for analog alien guitar pedals. Stevie Wonder continued to show us alternative uses for our pedals when he also now uses them with his Harpeggi harp. As it turns out, analog alien pedals sound really good with a lot of instruments. Bass guitars, acoustic guitars, banjos, violins, keyboards, and even the Chapman stick. Do we have a shot of the Chapman stick? Oh, there we go. So, um, one of the things that Jack and I are actually most proud of is the amazing musicians who are now using our pedals. Um, our list of affiliated artists include Stevie Wonder, James Burton, Johnny Highland, Tim Lefebvre, Susan Tedeschi, Pino Palladino, Elliot Easton of the Cars, and of course, Joe Walsh. When we first met Joe and spoke with him about our pedals, he said the, the one thing he liked most about them was that how responsive it was how responsive they were and how they didn't really have a sweet spot, but how like every setting was a sweet spot. Our association with Joe first started when we visited Sweetwater here in August of 2014, where we met over 130 sales engineers, and you guys were all so great, very enthusiastic about learning about our pedals and and just wanting to know all there was to know about them, which was great. During this visit, we met a sales engineer named Kenny Burgle. <laughs> Kenny came into the meeting, and he, knew, and he knew all there was to know about analog alien guitar pedals. He started telling the stories about the Who, 
And honestly, we just felt like we knew Kenny our whole lives within 10 minutes. During that meeting, Kenny also mentioned that one of his clients was Joe Walsh. And he said, guys, I'm telling you, the, the rumble seat's great. I, I know Joe would love it. I think we should send him one. So we said, OK, Kenny, sure. So we, we got home and recovered from our trip from Sweetwater, which took a little time. But then we contacted Kenny, and he gave us an address, and we packed up the pedal and sent it off. And um, we didn't hear anything. So after a couple months, I, I gave Kenny a call. And I said, Kenny, I was wondering what was going on. He goes, Joe, I just spoke with Joe Walsh this afternoon. He is crazy busy. He's getting ready for an Australian tour with the Eagles. I said, OK, Kenny. Well, I think he's super busy. It's OK. Just uh, keep us in the loop and, and let us know. He goes, listen. I guess he could tell I was a little disappointed. He goes, listen, Joe, I'm telling you, he's going to love it. I bet you he loves it so much he's going to call you. I said, OK, Kenny, thanks a lot. And the conversation ended. Of course, when I hung up, I thought to myself, yeah, Joe Walsh is really going to call us. Well, two months later, January 2015, the night before my brother and I leave for the NAMM show, I get a call from Kenny. He says, Joe, I just spoke with Joe Walsh. He said, Kenny, this rumble seat's the best thing I ever played through. Send me three. And Kenny. Actually, Ken actually, what he said was. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, my mom's well, gonna see this, so I kind of left that part get... out. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what happened. So obviously, uh, Kenny said, "Can we quote you on that?" And uh, and Joe said, "Sure, you can." So anyway, and he has been ever since. Uh, so Jack and I, of course, you know, next day we fly out, we go to the Nam show. And I have to tell you, honestly, there was not a person in California that, when, by the time we left, that didn't know that Joe Walsh was on tour with the Eagles in Australia playing the Rumble Seat. Obviously, we were blown away. And honestly, we really felt that, you know, that would be the end of it. But instead, it was just the beginning. Two months later, I walked into my office. I saw I had a message. I hit the button, and I heard, hey, guys, this is Joe Walsh. <laughs> And then silence. And then, guys, uh, this really is Joe Walsh. Listen, man, I'm, I'm really digging the rumble seat. It's great. I'm, I'm, looking, uh, I'm looking for a compressor. And um, I really like to work with you guys. I really dig your stuff, and I'm digging what you're doing. So give me a call. This really is Joe Walsh. <laughs> so of course, maybe thinking it was Kenny you know, kidding around with us, I was like, oh my god. So I had to kind of pull myself off the ceiling, and then I went and got my brother. And I let Jack hear it. And then I had to pull Jack off the ceiling, and it kind of went something like this. Uh, oh my god, that really was Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh really called us. Kenny was right. He really called us. What are we going to do? Well, should we call him back? Of course we're going to call him back. He's Joe Walsh. Well, should we call him now? No, we can't call him now. We've got to calm down. Just calm down. So after about an hour of that, <laughs> I, grabbed, I grabbed a pad of paper and, I, and, I, and a pencil, and I, I jotted down some talking points. Jack and I went out into our backyard, sat down at our picnic table, dialed the number, and it really was Joe Walsh. So during that first meeting, we decided we were going to build a pedal with a compressor and an overdrive circuit, and we were going to call that pedal the Joe Walsh Double Classic. And that's how the pedal came to be. So Jack the Double Classic. That's the classic amp side of the pedal, which is actually modeled after one of Joe's uh, favorite amps, which is an old Tweed Deluxe from the late 50s. Unlike that amp, though, it has independent tone controls for bass and treble with very wide sweeps. Treble off. Bass up. You find your happy spot. And there you go. And uh, Joe, if you've ever seen him perform, we've been lucky enough to have seen him a lot. And he invites us down and everything. And uh, 
he is constantly fiddling with the knobs. He changes so many guitars. So he actually really like works the pedals constantly as much as he does his guitars. The gain, he uh, wanted a nice sweep to the gain too, but he always wanted to hear like every note in the chord. He uh, comes from that school, I guess Keith Richards, Pete Townsend, they all, they all like that real true voice that they can hear with that overtone, even when you start increasing the gain. So you can still hear the chord definition. The compressor side of it, which is actually how we started with Joe, is uh, he was looking to get a compressor. He didn't really particularly like any Stompbox compressor that he ever used. And he was using professional compressors live, which was kind of awkward, I guess, to manipulate them. Because again, he's constantly going down on the pedal board and you know, just touching the knobs and just manipulating things depending on what guitar he's using. So we decided to model a compressor after more of a pro studio line. That we have a couple of them in our studio. And uh, after we did that, <coughs> which I'll demonstrate. He definitely didn't want a compressor that would squash his tone into extinction, which this one will not. You can still you can hear the compression on it without it. It's a very smooth musical compressor. And another thing that he was very keen in seeing and he wanted us to design into and incorporate into the circuit was he wanted to be able to use the compressor as a clean boost. So if you back off the ratio, increase the sensitivity and you set your output to taste, you go from compression to... So without it, with it, and it's great for just pushing your amp piece of, you know, he really loves those older Fender amp peg amps, he has a vast collection of these smaller little, you know, 10, 12 watt amplifiers that that really comes in handy with, and actually I have it set pretty much the way he does. Um, to get that, you know, boost. Uh, the last thing we incorporated in the pedal was a pre-post switch, which enabled you to take the compressor and put it pre or post the classic amp. And the reason for that was, uh, when we approached him with it, we, we asked him, you know, typically it would be the compressor before the amp. And he thought about it and he said, no, we have to flip them. <clears throat> and he says, and I'll tell you why. He said, when I use my wireless, and I hit the compressor first because of uh, the compression expansion that goes on in a wireless system. He says, I lose a little too much top end when I'm live. He said, so I want to be able to hit the classic amp first, EQ into the compressor, and then I'll find my sound that way. So we just incorporated that switch that just with a little relay network that you would find more in professional recording uh, consoles, but it just enables the compressor to flip and flop through the pedal, so it uh, made it a lot more versatile. And that's it, basically. Uh does anyone have any questions? Any questions? No. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No. No questions. Okay. Uh, we have a little more time. Jack, how about we uh, go over the twister? Oh, sure. The <clears throat> fuzz pedal. The uh, twister was the second pedal we came out with, and it's it's a fuzz, but it does a lot more than that. It's very versatile. So let's just hear the, the fuzz side of it first. <laughs> If I take the stability control, I can get that classic sound, you know, 60s vintage kind of, like you're taking a razor blade and slashing it through your speakers. But what made this compressor, um, sorry, this uh, fuzz a lot more versatile is if you turn the stability control up, you can increase a lot more voltage into the final collector stage of this transistor. And what that does is if you look at, at this uh, on a scope, you'll see the, the sine waves start to round off again. And it makes your upper end of the guitar very articulate, rather than just all fuzzed out. But what really makes this uh, fuzz even more special, and there's a tremendous amount of output gain with this, and there's a reason for it, is if I start turning the input knob down, you start losing the fuzz pretty quickly and increase the output. It's very quiet. And you start to get into overdrive land. It's very good with guitars that have weaker sounding pickups, older vintage guitars. You know, the 60s strats are really great and have a personality, but the pickups weren't that strong. And this is where this really comes in handy. I can really turn the input down to practically nothing and increase the output.
this pedal is actually used by one of our artists. His name is Tony Pascal, and he, if you're familiar with the TV show Duck Dynasty, Tony does all the music for that. He writes it, performs it, all the guitar parts. And this pedal is used on all his slide parts, whether they're acoustic, he'll mic them up, and he'll d d use the dobro, and he'll, he'll play with this pedal, or whether they're electric. So it gives a you know, nice attitude and just the flavor that he likes with it. Uh, and there's a buffer on it, too, if you need it. Some guitarists don't realize what happens when you start incorporating you know, all these different pedals into each other, and you don't know how to balance everything out electronically, and you lose a lot of high end because of impedance mismatches and things like that, old technical stuff. But the buffer just makes up for a multitude of sins, you know, in case that actually happens. So we thought we'd just put it on a big switch and let you hit it if you needed it or not. Cool. And that's a twister. Uh, I, it looks like we have a little bit more time. Can you go through the power pack? Sure. The power pack came out last year. It's a 15 dB clean boost. Does not alter your tone or your frequencies at all. You push it up. <laughs> Also is a great makeup gain stage if you're using older vintage pedals that you know have seen better days and, and the voltage isn't quite right with them as well and you want to bring the level up without altering everything you can use it to do that and with the reverb let's just take the, this off even though this is a newer circuit but you'll get the idea so here's the volume and let's just say I'm really comfortable with the um, with the level and the trail that I'm getting, but I just like it to be a little bit louder. And this is actually after the reverb, and it's still quiet. So without it. And it works for the delay too. And this really came about because of the studio too. Um, I think it gives us quite an advantage and a, a unique perspective because we, we really were studio owners and we work with so many different musicians, a lot of local bands, all different genres of music from, you know, Joan Jett, who actually lives on the island, does a lot of work with us, to just a lot of local groups from punk to country, whatever it is. And you get a flavor and a feel for what different musicians want and need. And the, the studio is a perfect base for that because that's how everything starts and you know it establishes us and then we work it from there. And that's basically that's it. That's basically it. Um, does anybody have any? Oh, oh, we have two. Yeah, out of curiosity, what amp are you playing through right now? It's uh, it, one of my favorites. It's, a, it's an old Russian amplifier, Stovetech Midget 50. I actually have two. I ha we'll have them up in office hours too. I love it. It's, it's built really, really well, very roadworthy, and the tone is great. I'm actually going through the, uh, the, the low end side of it right now. The other, is the uh, high end has has a lot of gain, to, you know, to it, and it, it gains out a little too much to demo the pedals. And the the, cabin, and yeah, the, cabin yeah, the cabinet, the cabinet's a ten inch tone tubby, ceramic, so great speakers. It was broken in as soon as they took it out of the box and put it right in. It was fantastic. Kenny had a question. Oh, so yeah. you guys haven't talked about and one of the things. Joe, of course, loves the sound. You um, you didn't say this, but Joe called me and said, "Man, these boys are fantastic. <laughs> Can they build a compressor?" Well, sh sure thing. Okay, so with the twister, the, the brown pedal here, it comes in a nice wooden box uh, and a little satchel. We pack it with some straw, uh, sticker, and you get a little bottle of analog alien hot sauce. <laughs> we like hot uh, sauce. With the Fuzz Bubble 45, uh, we used to ship it in a tin, uh, but we actually had to stop doing that because they, they were just getting dented and all that too much. But it comes in a nice cooler bag, and we put a bottle of analog alien bubbles in it, soap bubbles. So that that comes with, for the that kids. comes with that. Then the other Joe's pedal and the the rumble seat and the uh, base station all, all come in their own cooler bag. And those pedals all ship with their own power supply because there's just too much going on with those pedals. Uh, you know, just to run it by a battery, it would drain them too quick. Uh, and yeah, you get stickers, and we always send out a brochure and of course the instructions with everything. And that's uh, that's pretty much our page. We, we it really came about because when we were doing this. Jack and I, as kids, like one of our favorite treats, seriously, was Cracker Jack. And I always felt like, you know, not only did you get your snack, but you even got a, like a surprise. And I, I always felt that like, 
and when buying stuff. It's mm -hmm. always, even with Sweetwater, you guys always send the candy. I love the candy. Yeah. It's awesome. So, you know, we, so we, we, to. we do that. So it's, and that's, that's really where it came back. I'm sorry, what? I missed that. Somebody said something. What? The red one? The wooden thing looking thing? This one. Oh, the, this yeah, this the is the, um, the the alien comp. It just came out about a month ago. You guys just picked it up. And uh, it's the same compressor circuit found in the Joe Walsh Double Classic. There's no difference. So if you don't want you know, the whole nine yards with the, uh, the classic amp side or whatnot, and you're just looking for a very good smooth compressor, again, that doesn't squash your tone into extinction, that you could use as a clean boost, that's, that's your ticket. Okay, so I think we're out of No, time. someone's up. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Doctor. Oh, right here. Oh, sorry, there you go. Yep. Yeah, I wanted to hear real quick if you would demonstrate the power pack with something with a little more gain to it, like a, you know, an overdrive sound. Does the, is the power pack going to work as a boost when you've got a lot of gain behind it? No, no. As a matter of fact, if you listen to the, uh, this is the stove deck now, if you can hear that. There's really no gain at all. I have it on two, and that's why I have it in this, uh, the other channel because I don't really want a lot of gain. And this, you can really, or again, use it as unity boost. We actually gave one to. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you mean to playing it into another overdrive pedal? No. He, oh, yes. you want the? Oh, sorry, sorry. That's I didn't understand I that. Um, sure. So let's. A lot, of, uh, a lot of times you see boosts that work really, really well on a on a clean tone. On a clean signal, but when you add <coughs> distortion or, or overdrive behind it, it it kind of fails. You lose about a few dB there. Okay, that that is true. So let's talk the twister. That's really subtle. A another cool thing too, I, I didn't mention about the double classic is, uh, and the way Joe likes to use it too is. You can use the compressor, like we said, as a clean boost, but you can also clean boost into the classic amp side. So if he sets it, this is just the classic amp. Now I'm going to boost into it. So it pushes like an amp. You know, we just studied that that whole aspect of what he wanted and, you know, you understand where he comes from as a player too, you know, very, comes from that, that, that different time where, you know, it was just the guitar and the amp and so he wanted pedals that, you know, actually sounded, it gave him that sound. And I think his quote is, it's like adding another amp to your rig and that's exactly what he wanted, what, how he felt about it, so. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Okay, well, in closing, Jack and I would like to say that we just feel there's no other place like Sweet War in the world. I think what really separates you guys from so many other music retailers out there is the dedication of the sales engineers here to really learn and, and, and understand all about the gear that they sell and then educate their customers on what they need based on what they tell you guys. And that's, re that's really tough and it's unique. And I really feel it's why Sweetwater has become our biggest dealer. Not to, I guess, borrow a very used phrase, but an educated consumer is really our best customer. And you guys do a great job in educating everyone. So we really appreciate it and look forward to continuing our association with Sweetwater. Uh, Jack and I are hosting office hours today in the Fumata room from noon to four. And we'll be serving lunch and you can enter to win some really cool analog alien prizes. So please come up and see us. We'd love to talk to you and, as many of you as we can. And we would like to thank Kenny Burgle for all the support and for introducing us to Joe Walsh. Too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Really appreciate it. You made this not so terrifying. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.